Welcome to Coffee and Conversation. My name is Honorine, and today I'm with Stephen Newbold from the Department of Arts Education. Stephen, welcome, and thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you for having me. So tell me more about yourself. So a little bit about me. Let's see, where should I start? Um, I'm from Miami, Florida, um, born and raised. Um, I have about 13 years of um, K-12 um, educator experience. I started my teaching career um, at my alma mater, uh, Miami Northwestern Senior High School um, back in 2007. Um, so I've been, I've been teaching after, um, after I graduated from undergrad, which was Florida State University. I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life but um, my dad, all of his sisters, and many of my family members are educators. So it seemed like an easy transition to kind of go into the family business. Um, then I discovered I was good at it. So I stayed there. Okay, and why art and not uh, history, for instance? So um, the merge of the two is, is interesting actually. So I have a degree in political science, which is kind of the history side. And then I have a second bachelor's degree that I got from FSU in art history. So when I started teaching, I was hired to teach American and world history to high school students. Okay. But I always had that art background. So as soon as I was able to get an art teacher position, I jumped on it and I kind of been doing it ever since. But that that history historian part of my life uh, just aligns well with, with the artistic side. So I go back and forth between both. Um, and what I see behind you, is it what you've made? So um, I chose these pieces because they're um, student pieces that we collaborated um, over the years. Like this one here on this side is um, actually Jean-Michel Basquiat. And um, you wouldn't believe a group of first graders um, did that. First graders? Yeah. Oh um, maybe in 2013, maybe. I don't know. Um, but I did the outline, the, the contour line drawing of Basquiat, um, who's an artist. Um, and the, the students, I was like, have at it. And this is what they came up with. And this is beautiful. So. <laughs> Yeah, I think so too. I, um, <laughs> I held on to it. And then this piece right here, um, it's a okay. portrait collage. So the same, the same thing. And I did that with middle school students maybe five years ago. Okay. Um, and um, the same thing with the outline and they just went and had at it. And one class period, this masterpiece was born. Wow. Yeah. And so did they come up with the idea of the collage or you said, you know, you have to do a collage and that's the picture and do whatever you want, but it has to be a collage. So we were working on portrait collages, but I always like to model my expectations for them because a lot of students, at least um, younger kids, um, they lead with how bad they are. Like, I'm not a good artist. I don't know how to draw. So what I do is try to give them um, an opportunity to be successful at what they do. So I set up a group situation where all of them were working on this one piece. I'm like, look, you just created a, a, a work of art in a class period. You can go now by yourself and create an original piece using the collage technique. So kind of just, you know, jump starts their creativity when I do it that way. Oh, I love it. So you seem very passionate about teaching. So why did you decide to leave K-12 teaching um, to start a PhD? So I think it was a, a natural transition. Um, I'm a, I, I like to think of myself as a lifelong um, learner. And um, in 2019, well, I started a business. First off, let me just back up just a little bit. So <laughs> I, um, I, usually, I usually never work during the summer. Like I worked during the school year, but one summer I found myself needing to get summer employment. Um, and I didn't apply to teach um, in a timely fashion. 
So I said, you know what? I have a talent in art. Let me use my talent in art to make some money. So I did a, a paint class um, in, at Bayside. Bayside is this area down in Miami, Florida, um, an outside area, literally on the side of the bay. <laughs> and I took some canvases out there and um, set them up and passive buyers came and they were looking and they were interested in what I was doing. And they paid $20 a pop for me to do like a live um, instructional session with them. Okay. And my business, New Bold Images, was born that day. So that transitioned okay. a bit to me being like a motivational artist. So now as a K-12 teacher, I have this skill set with being a great teacher. And mm -hmm. also now I'm, I'm going into the business world. That trickled down into me getting gigs at universities where I was doing uh, motivational paint classes. At, I got one at John Hopkins and another um, gig at Oregon State University. And I'm like, I'm in these educational spaces with, with my bachelor's degree, but I felt like there was a disconnect between what I was presenting and what I could present if I had that that higher education. What do you mean by motivational um, art? That's artist? Yeah. I call them motivational artists. So um, again, so the program I'm in is art education, but the school of, uh, the Department of Art Education has four different strands. Um, they have art therapy, they have um, museum studies, art ed, and also art administration. So I wouldn't dare call myself an art therapist because I don't have that background, but I do believe that I'm able to tap into people's emotions and move them through art. So when I call myself a motivational artist, um, you know, doing these workshops where we are exploring identity through art um, to motivate one to kind of deal with what's going on inside, um, me not diagnosing them with anything, but me giving them an opportunity to kind of grapple with, with whatever's happening internally, but to get it out through art. And instead of them talking about themselves, they're talking about the art, which they are the art, but it's an easier way to digest um, maybe some internal things that are happening, so. Wow. So do you have like a, some kind of degree in psychology or <laughs> no? I don't. No, I don't. Um, which, is, which is also interesting because one of my doctoral seminar classes, the teaching and learning one, we've been talking a lot about um, on social learning theories, uh, learning theories in general, and the social learning theory and constructivism. Um, I've been super interested in those because you know, they, they deal a lot with psychology. So knowing the different developmental stages of students and um, where their brains are at a certain point in their lives kind of informs my instruction. So while I don't have an in-depth background in it, um, I do have enough surface knowledge to um, possibly maybe one day get to that point. So you're thinking about getting another degree? I feel like I need to. <laughs> <laughs> you like studying. <laughs> <laughs> and I actually don't like studying, but <laughs> I do believe that I'm a lifelong learner. So like when I'm interested in one thing and I don't have that skill set, like, well, the only way to get it is, is to learn it. So sure. and do you have an idea of what your research proposal will be about? So I'm leaning towards, um, so I'm not sure if you, you know the demographics with black male educators. So about 2%, um, so black males represent 2% of K-12 educators, which is a small uh, percentage when you think about the grand scheme of things. Yeah. My interest lies in why that 2% like stays stay in public education because there are probably plenty of reasons why that number is low but I'm more so interested in those who are here like me like like what drives us to stay 
what drives us to persist through the field. And um, that's where my research is going. So when you say um, through the field, um, so I, I only knew about um, the demographic because I've read your profile. <laughs> Before that, I didn't know. And I was actually surprised by this very small number. I knew it was a small number, but I, I guess I was hoping that it would be bigger. Um, but so when you say, um, why do they stay in public education? Do you mean that they are more in private education because it's somehow easier? Or it's just in general, uh, there are not a lot of black male educators? In general, the representation is, is quite low. Um, and do you have any ideas of the reason behind it? Well, um, when I think about it right now, at least with Florida State, I was, I was talking to someone within my department and we just brought up the, um, the Department of Art Education's website. When I pulled it up initially, there weren't any black men on, on the site. So it read almost as if um, the department was recruiting a certain type of people, person. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and that, that might not be the case, but that's the way it read. So when I say representation, representation does matter because mm -hmm. when I teach K through 12 boys and they see me as an art teacher, it's like, Oh, I always thought art teachers would look like this or look like that. And now that they see me here, it's like, oh, it's possible for me to do that too. So when the number is low, the recruitment and the retention of black male, it, the pipeline isn't there mm -hmm. to start with because maybe some students don't see themselves being able to do it. But realistically, I haven't dug, I did a deep dive in the research but teachers make low, low, low pay. So um, I imagine maybe somebody will choose to go, you know, do another profession that might pay more. I don't know. But also when you don't feel like you belong to a particular culture, um, you, you might choose not to do that. Like I'm the only black male um, within the Department of Art Education, um, not, not the, umbrella department but in my strand and it, it's difficult sometimes um, to almost feel like you're representing um, the voice of a race or the voice of a gender um, and you, you don't have the I guess the the backup or the support so um, yeah it's not the first time that I hear that I uh, mean in interviews um, and um, it's one of the goals of, um, of some people of color to say like, you know, as you said, representation matters. And I wanna, I wanna show um, other students that they also belong here. It's not only for other people, they belong here. Um, right. Because as you said, when you look on the website, you don't see it. Um, so I noticed that you are, you know, a PhD student in French. Yes. So, um, but you're, you're a candidate now, so you're on your dissertation piece? Yes, I'm in the hard phase of the dissertation where you just want to quit, <laughs> to be honest. Um, it's just that moment where, yeah, where I'm just like, should I continue or should I quit? Yeah. It's, you it's know what? Go ahead. No, go ahead. It's funny you say, should I, should I stay or should I quit? I've had moments um, in this first year of my doctoral studies where, you know, every other week, it's like, do I really wanna do this? Like, this is the most challenging thing I never had to do. At least with the master's degree, there was a goal in mind with it. I, I was doing these, you know, workshops at these different universities and I had already worked as an educator for a certain amount of years. So I thought that um, getting the theoretical framework to, to match my practical experience as an art educator would like propel me to that next level of my career. But I did that master's degree in a year. I started summer 2019 and graduated spring 2020. 
right in the middle, you know, at the start of the pandemic, didn't get a commencement. It was, it was kind of traumatic because I pushed so hard to finish within that year and then I didn't get the culminating experience to, to celebrate my accomplishment, but then turned around and went straight into the PhD program in the fall. Wow. Where it was a hundred percent virtual experience. I did the P I did the master's online, but I didn't expect to start the PhD virtual where I had to engage with people, you know, on Zoom and also do my graduate assistantship and also, you know, try to stay alive because, you know, people were dropping like flies, you know, during COVID-19. So uh -huh. when you say, should I stay or should I quit? I'm like, there are bigger fish to fry in the world for me to worry about right now. And I'm stressed out about, you know, um, my reading or, you know, not not feeling like and and this this is an issue for me i don't have like imposter syndrome or something why i don't feel like i belong like i do feel like i belong here That's i good. do know that i'm contributing to the community in the positive way but i always ask myself am i getting that same thing back to feed into me so like i require to be fed into by this experience in order to keep going. And I feel like I found ways to, to, to get nourishment um, at the university that propels me to, to continue going. So I don't feel like stopping. So how would you say COVID impacted um, your research? Um, so you talked about the fact that you felt there were way more important things in the world going on right now than my studies. Um, but I still need to go through it and to push uh, further. Um, but, you know, when you say survive, could you, could you expand on that? So, I mean, I literally survive, like, like live through it. Um, when, when COVID originally started, um, well, when they shut everything down in March of 2020, I, um, I did these um, self these portraits of students, they actually created them. We called them annotated selfies. And they, they took a selfie and then they pulled adjectives that they connected with and annotated their portraits with them. So they digitally put these adjectives on top of their portraits to let the world know who they believe that they am. I am dot, 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 right? So this one particular student um, he, he classified himself as helpful, as adventurous, as um, a multiple like of positive words. But then he also had words like vengeful and afraid and, um, you know, some other words that people might look at as negative. Mm -hmm. But it was really his way of painting a picture to other people that like, Everything isn't just this this perfect, um, you know, snapshot of what you think we should be. And I feel like, like I'm living that story as an adult person when it comes to my experience in grad school, because I see myself, you know, as this person, but other people might look at me and have their own opinion of who I am, and it. It's not based on anything that I'm actually presenting. I, I think it's based on stereotypes, mm. really, to be honest. I think it's based on stereotypes, mm -hmm. but there's also a lot for me to contribute to this experience. Yeah. And I really, really find myself living in what I have to contribute to this experience because that's the only thing that makes sense for me um, to continue um, pushing forward. Like, what do I have to, to contribute to this educational space to change things? Because that same website that I mentioned earlier, yeah. I looked at it, I went back to it, actually, when I knew I was doing this interview, mm -hmm. I went back in those pictures that painted that, that 
that image that painted that picture to me that maybe the department was recruit recruiting certain people like that the picture's no longer there so they listen to I don't know I think so so that's good I think so and Honorina, I think really without you know me being here there's no reason to to think about the alternative so it's like they're not necessarily doing wrong by showcasing the people who traditionally come through the program, but not taking into account how that might look to a person that's shopping, you know, for universities and they go look at it and it's like, no, well, I don't, it doesn't look like I belong here. Let me go look at somewhere else. So my last question for you is, um, how do you picture yourself in seven years? Let's see. So. So I'll be Dr. Newbold at that point, mm -hmm. right? No longer, no longer Mr. Newbold. Um, honestly, I would love to see um, me be a part of curating this group of black male art educators and sending them out into the world to, to collect stories on how they're impacting their students. Like, how does the world change by me being here? Okay. Um, I, I want to see myself being like, like, like the leader of that. Uh, maybe a campaign to recruit while I'm targeting, you know, like, like maybe students who went to perform in visual arts high schools throughout the state and giving them a pathway to their master's and possibly a PhD be in our education or something like giving them that foundation it's like this is possible if you work towards it like a lot of people and i don't want to jump off to a different conversation but a lot of people like i didn't always want to be an educator i wanted to be an attorney but education is like the family business so it was like easy for me to do it but when i discovered that i was good at it i wasn't settling for being a teacher it was something that i wanted to do Okay. I want to tap into those people who who want to be educators, but don't feel like they have that pathway to do it because they don't see themselves at it. And not just people like like black boys. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time, Stephen. That was a very interesting and fascinating conversation. I really enjoyed it and learned a lot. So thank you very much. Thank you for You're your welcome. time. But I hope it was clear and concise and I got a message out there that maybe you know somebody else can connect to and it will inspire them to keep pushing and persisting and and, and being themselves and you know meeting their destiny because I feel like sometimes you press pause on your destiny but it always finds you yeah so thank you for having me mm -hmm.